Well, uh, I really enjoyed last talk and uh, yesterday's seminar and how you, how you, you go so easily from the micro perspective to the macro perspective and how, how you make all these links and connections. So my, I think my point today is to, to underline this and to say that um, we really need to, to continue the focus on um, the, the structures of inequalities, of injustices. And um, my presentation will be very, very similar to what we did uh, yesterday on the, uh, at the macro level, which is where I'm more comfortable with. Um, because uh, your depiction of the evolution of the, the Romanian uh, economy and society is really similar to the Portuguese one. Uh, so we have been going through the same processes of neoliberalism, globalization, financialization, um, and they have produced the same unequal results. Um, but uh, the impacts, of course, are, uh, are differentiated because we went through this process uh, at an uh, earlier time, so the Portuguese accession to, to the, European the European community was in 18, 1986. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and Romania was in 2007, so we start earlier, but we went through the same processes and uh, the, the starting points were also different because uh, many was a, a post-socialist uh, um, country and Portugal is a, a South European country, uh, so uh, the impacts were, were differentiated but at the same time similar. So this is, this is the point I'm going to try to make uh, today, which is really to keep stressing the structural causes, causes of uh, inequality and justice. Uh, so we should not, we should keep this in mind when we discuss uh, the prospects for intersection of justice. Try to keep my time. I'm going to to read. Um, so my point is that in Portugal, in South in South Europe, uh, the processes of um, the processes of inequality of injustice are by and large the result of the process of European integration, which has been a neoliberal process of advancing the interests of financial capital. So the recent evolution of capitalism is financialized evolution. So uh, the process of European integration has been a process whereby the peripheral economies have been increasingly subordinated to the interests of international finance and other forms of capital located in the European core and to the national and international institutions under their influence. So in Portugal, there are two key moments. The first is the preparatory process leading to the accession to the European Economic Community, which took place in 86, so 21 years before it happened in Romania. And this led to reforms in order to participate in the single market. And the second key moment was uh, the preparation towards the creation of the single currency in circulation already for 20 years. So the creation of the single market in the domains of capital goods and service, which dissolved trade barriers within the community, requires substantial structural transformations within a short time span. So this is the, the traditional Washington consensus recipe, privatization, liberalization, deregulation in many sectors of the economy, including finance, and the opening up <coughs> of um, similar low-cost labor competitors, such as the case of Eastern European countries, 
uh, including also China. Uh, the project of the single currency, set up in the Maastricht Treaty, uh, imposed the common anti-fiscal and monetary policy for the countries willing to be part of the area. Uh, this new currency allowed an almost unlimited access to loanable money capital at low interest rates, often unavailable to countries with similar levels of development. So the combination of cheap credit, loss of competitive and competitiveness with the strong currency, and the continued straitjacket of budgetary restrictions favor private corporate and household indebtedness very much centered on the real estate and the housing sector. So um, integration fostered uh, private indebtedness, both from corporations and households. Uh, the lack of control over monetary and exchange rate policy at the national level um, fed the credit-driven form of financialization that led to the transfer of investment to the more protective non-tradable sectors, resulting in reduced productivity, growth relative to wage and price increases, increases in accentuating the economic weaknesses of the country. So this is why you must take, must take um, the productive sphere into account. Um, so what happened was um, a growing divergence with the core with the low productive sectors with already significant weight in the economy, such as construction, accommodation, and food services, increasing their relevance, both in terms of growth, added wealth, and employment, while high productive sectors, such as information and communication technology and other business services, grew at a much lower pace. Uh, the traditional sectors, uh, such as agriculture, fishing, textiles, and footwear have declined because they have failed to keep up with the competition coming from Eastern Europe and China um, in the context of the strong hero. So, what happened with the process of uh, European integration at the, the production side was um, an expanding market for exports from the core while fostering increasing competition among its peripheries. So it, so we put the peripheries competing against each other and then reducing a, a race to the bottom across the, the peripheries. So the result has been a mounting current account deficits and external debt, which contrasts with the, with, to the evolution of core European countries, most notably Germany, that has instead developed export-oriented rules, accumulating surplus in their current trade account, thus allowing and requiring a continued full of global money capital to the southern European periphery. So, indebtedness have been promoted so as to to increase demand for uh, the exports from from the poor. <coughs> In our work, we have depicted this as uh, as new peripheral financialization processes, also drawing very much on our steam uh, work systems theory, as we mentioned yesterday. Um, so, um, accounting this term tries to account, to account for both the intermediate position of the Portuguese economy in the world economy, combining characteristics of developed and developing countries, as it has been marked by late industrialization and a backward economic development relative to the core, and to the institutional features of its financial system, which is very much more based on debt rather than on capital markets, it's more, more, which is the case of the poor. So, um, I, both peripheries, south and eastern, have followed similar subordinated relation with the core, uh, but these have been distinct uh, as they have distinct uh, historic trajectories. Um, as, uh, there are at least three sharp differences. The post-socialist trajectory of the East, a later integration into the EU, and the geographical proximity to the two countries of the poor. So, um, 
So the, the post-socialist trajectory produced a large-scale restructuring of economic and social relations through the availability of large pool of depreciated corporate assets and qualified cheap labor. This is a difference to the South, which uh, our labor force is much more underqualified. Um, but the financialization process is also so different. Uh, it was much more based on foreign-owned uh, multinational <coughs> corporations, most notably from Germany, which also outsources parts of production to the region. So in our case, it's much more based on debt. In the East, it's much more based on foreign direct investment from uh, multinationals, from the poor. So even though um, this inflow of foreign capital allowed to consolidate the relevant industrial sector in the East, the process of, of course, uh, you know much more than I about this, but it was of course based on dependence of the nation as this process was led from, from the outside. A stark difference between the two countries is of course uh, the participation in the euro area, and from the beginning, uh, which um, produced really, really high levels of private debt, um, whereas in the East, it was uh, financialization was also much more based on the participation of foreign banks and the foreign ownership of domestic banks. Um, that is still a more moderate rise of private debt contracted on foreign currency. So this created also its own problems uh, so, um, similar to, to the previous these countries that to accumulate foreign reserves and, uh, and, that, to, uh, and that to to deal with the, the, the fluctuation of the currency. Um, But in both countries, um, the growth model was based on labor devaluation, and um, and in some also there was some rise of household debt. The global crisis accentuated all these processes. Um, in the south, um, it 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 turned into a sovereign debt crisis, uh, where the states. Uh, could no longer um, finance themselves in the markets, uh, so they have to, to ask for official loans from the Turkey, as we all know, and this was attached uh, to radical structural adjustment reforms, in addition to the reforms that have been done of privatization, deregulation, and so on. So there was a new phase of, uh, phase of, of these neoliberal policies attached also to to uh, xenophobic uh, discourses, you know, the South European countries depict as uh, living beyond their means, expending all their money, women, red wives, spending all their time at cafes, and all these, all these discourse towards uh, the South. Um, but since the crisis, indeed, we had a new wave of neoliberal policies, implementing ever more draconian measures in the labor markets, downgrading wage income and uh, working conditions, uh, leading to the dismantling of collective bargain, bargaining arrangements at national and sectoral levels, uh, the loss of protection of, work, of workers through facilitating employee dismissals, intensifying working hours, cutting pay for night and extraordinary hours, and so on. So the result, of course, was uh, growing economic and social fragilities, resulting in recession, unprecedented for the Portuguese case, double-digit unemployment rates, especially among the youth, led leading to immigration flow and seems unseen in Portugal since the 60s and 70s. In addition to the weakening of labor rights in national legislations, 
There was also the duration of public employment, public and civil servants' rights, the degradation of um, the quality of services provided in relevant social areas, such as, such as health and education. Um, and this, um, this uh, austerity does further degrade uh, public services, most needed for um, the lower classes. And we also have had a new wave of privatizations of of the companies that still remain in public ownership, such as energy, transport, communications, postal service, and insurance sectors. Um, and this uh, meant, at uh, the, the most critical moment, that public assets would have to be sold to foreign private investors at set prices, and uh, leading Southern European industries were then purchased by the European companies in service, public activities, and finance, especially French, German, as well as Chinese. So this, this meant, again, an expropriation of most valuable assets uh, and dispossession within the EU. So from the peripheries to the core. The situation of the banking sector requiring uh, the imposition of stringent capital assets ratio that was applied at the time, created serious difficulties for the, the local uh, enterprise as well as um, as well as for families. So we had um, we had uh, non the rise of non-performing loans from both corporations and families, and this also led to. <laughs> this possession is a lot of families lost their homes, uh, and these were sold to to financial uh, financial investors uh, from the core, uh, also mostly from uh, the United States. The what do you call them? The hedge funds from uh, hedge funds from the United States. So, um, so the developments within the economy, the labor markets, uh, social services uh, resulted um, in the growth of uh, newly created uh, low-paid jobs for the younger generations, uh, and thus, um, so the rise of, of low-income, uh, precarious jobs for the low for the younger groups of the population, create, create a barrier to the, the financialization of houses through credit. So the post-crisis uh, has brought about new agents, such as institutional investors in the real estate, as, as I mentioned, uh, further straining the livelihoods of the youth, facing not only less favorable working conditions, but also paying uh, increasing living costs. All these processes were state-led, of course, because under recession, the state created all these fiscal incentives for foreign, uh, for foreign investment, particularly in the real estate and in the housing sector, which deepened um, the effect on social reproduction <coughs> to its impacts uh, on house prices and, and, and rent. So this is just to give you an indication how housing is so critical to all these developments. So you have um, uh, the evolution of house, house prices in the first graph. Um, this is a global average, so you see that house prices is, is really being escalating. Uh, which means in the second graph you have uh, the value of residential wealth just for the Eurozone countries. So when prices rise, it means that those who are uh, asset holders, who are proprietors, are becoming richer. So this is really a huge source of inequality, income and wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. In the third graph, 
you, you have different assets and you can really see that residential property is the main asset at the global level. So it is really the main uh, source of inequality. But when prices are rising, it means that not only those who have those assets are becoming wealthier, but also that those who don't have those assets have to pay much more mm -hmm. to access to, to, to access to housing. So housing is becoming more and more unaffordable. We have here for the four, for the four regions of Europe, uh, housing overburden rates by income point trials. So if, if, in, the, in, in the top, you can see the first quintile. So this is the 20% of the people with the low, lowest income. So you can see that the costs of housing for them are really, really much higher than of the, the other rest, the other 80%. So the, what this means? This means that um, living costs of um, the lower classes uh, are really high. And much different from the rest. So this means that the housing is mainly a problem of a tiny portion of the population. So this is this is really important for when you think about mobilization of mm. <laughs> of people for um, the housing crisis because a lot of people, those who are at the bottom, are pretty well off. Mm. Um, and the first quintile, of course, the first quintile is uh, is where there are. The, 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 the lower classes uh, and where they intersect with other sources of inequalities you have mentioned, such as race, uh, nationality, gender. And, and I think gender is, is also uh, an important issue here as uh, it, it, uh, women uh, from single parent households um, which are overrepresented also by uh, other minority groups, are in the end ultimate absorbers of economic and social shocks, taking up uh, an increasing burden uh, with social reproductive activities, not only because the, the cost of living for them is much higher, because they also have a precarious uh, situation in the labor market, but also when the state retreats the social provision, it is then we have to have an extra burden performing the care they need uh, for their for their mm -hmm. children. So I stop here. I think I